Okay, let's go ahead and get started. So there is a new lab um, that will help with the homework. Uh, let's see what's published. Right, homework 13 is out there now, and there's this new lab, um, which uh, Bo shows how to go through and uh, call up machines generate data from them. We're just using Pythonic notation here to just print a hundred of the symbols. Um, and then there's some sort of uh, wrapper helper code that you pass in the data, the morph length, the future distance you want to go, and your tree depth. And this is using what's called subtree merging reconstruction, which is the main way I introduced reconstruction methods. There are others, but uh, and we'll hear about those uh, from Chris. Um, returns a machine, and uh, lo and behold, it's very close to, up to numerical fluctuations in the transition probability is the original. So, now there are many ways to break this, or to get silly answers, which is generate a sample of length three, right? So, in these exercises, hint, just, it doesn't hurt, just throw lots of data at it for now. The point is to, to see the reconstruction process go through and then uh, and not really wor worry so much about data fluctuations. Um, the lecture that Chris is going to give, Chris Tarlayev is going to give on Bayesian inference will bring us closer to dealing with data size fluctuations. Those techniques. Um, process table, there's this handy little function in here uh, that you pass it a machine or actually a list of machines and you say give me the entropy rate, statistical complexity, and E. These are character strings that just identify those and it plots a nice little table. So, um, Here's an example of well, pseudo real data from the logistic map and uh, again there's a little helper function you pass in a logistic map, parameter value, and the amount of data you want. We'll get some iterates of that. There's a way of taking the iterates on the interval <coughs> and partitioning it, another helper function. And this isn't deep, uh, sophisticated code. Um, then we get our symbolic dynamics uh, sequence out. Now it's just binary data. We can plug it back into that infer machine code. Again, has parameters here. And there are ways of doing this so you get crazy wild things. So stick close to the suggested things for now. Uh, again, lots of iterates help. And then in this particular case, that was r equal 4. Well, that's where the, we proved that the map is Markovian. So surprise, surprise, we get the uh, fair coin back out. Or <coughs> fair coin up to statistical fluctuations. And can print out now very familiar properties for that inferred model. Okay, just to give you some idea, and also maybe kind of hinting a bit about what might be components in a project. No, a dynamical system. Look at some behavior. It gets partitioned, and then we do some kind of informational or computational mechanics analysis. So that's kind of the architecture of a, of a straightforward project. Okay. Well, it turns out that, so let's get started here. Um, <clears throat> today we have some real work to do. <laughs> um, um, most of that code, certainly calculating that process table command gave all the information properties when you passed in an Epsilon machine. Um, there's a lot of um, technology built into the computation mechanics in Python library. <coughs> and today's lecture and Thursday's lecture are going to be give you some sense of how things go. And I'll try to indicate some of the problems that confront you if you want to calculate these informational quantities from an Epsilon machine, or just in general, how do you estimate them from a given presentation of a process. <coughs> so, 
so far, the way we've been discussing things, we've been talking about the epsilon machines, in particular focusing on the predictive uh, equivalence relation, the causal state equivalence relation, which gave us these partitions of the space of histories, so-called causal states. And as we emphasize, we talk about the intrinsic semantics that uh, a model like that gives. These causal states were conditions of knowledge about the past that let you do optimal predictions of the future. Okay. Well, that's just the tip of the iceberg in this computation mechanics setting. So what I'm going to introduce today is actually a tantamount to a hierarchy of states of optimal prediction. Now, the language will largely focus on different kinds of models or presentations, um, different kinds of states. Um, but in fact, it's sort of a quite general idea. In other words, the, <coughs> the original predictive equivalence relation actually induces um, conditions of knowledge for optimal prediction, but it's sort of um, conditions of conditions of conditions of knowledge for prediction. It actually telescopes out. We're only going to go up one level. That's all that's really necessary for most of the things we're dealing with. Until we get to um, infinite state processes, and then it kind of is unavoidable. <coughs> um, so, so there's some uh, mathematical heavy lifting to do to introduce this. Um, I'm hoping the gods of uh, clarity will smile on me as I explain some of the technical difficulties, but there'll be examples. Um, and in fact, just as kind of a heads up, think back to the Tahitian vacation example. We're talking about reading the newspaper, getting forecasts, and trying to infer what the state of the weather was uh, on Tahiti before we hopped on the plane and packed our bags. Um, <clears throat> it's in, in one, one way to think about this is this notion of synchronization we've been talking about. It's, it's like a key idea here. It helps organize a lot of the um, constructions. We have some observations. There can be a setting in which we have a model, but we don't know what the current state is, and we're trying to guess what that is. So, so that's kind of the overall um, uh, mathematical setting. Um, do a little bit of review today. Uh, mostly kind of notational things, um, but it's a little bit subtle. Um, we're going to talk about conditional probabilities and also conditional random variables. Um, we need to condition on things like what is the current state distribution or what was the state distribution when the process started. So I have to be more explicit about that. I hope it ends up being intuitive. <laughs> we kind of dive down to a level of um, notational detail that I hope will asymptotically be helpful. Um, we, we, then with, with this sort of behind us, we'll start talking about this new concept of state, so-called mixed states. and the induced model, mixed state presentations. And we'll go through some examples. Then on Thursday, um, we get to have more fun. We actually get to see the, the benefit of using this mixed state presentation. So not only are we introducing this new concept of state, and um, uh, it has a, a number of, of direct consequences. In particular, um, how we can very efficiently calculate these various complexity measures and I'll talk in some detail about fast ways of calculating block entropies. Um, um, and we'll do a, a, just a revisit the synchronization information and rewrite things in a very efficient way. Um, and then this will give you some sense of what's inside the computation mechanics and Python package. Uh, in particular, right, there's a problem here. You know, if you have some kind of stochastic process, you're looking at words of length L. If it's have a slightly positive entropy rate, the number of sequences that you can see of length L grows exponentially in L. So that's an exponential number of numbers you have to keep track of. Um, <clears throat> and makes estimating uh, word distributions quite problematic, especially if you're trying to do it literally from data. Take a window of length L and sweep it through and just counting things up. It's in many ways, the <laughs> one of the punchlines here is going to be, this is why we build models because we need more efficient ways of, of estimating quantities than the sort of literal frequency counting of words. 
So um, we'll see how this mixed state presentation leads to very efficient um, way of calculating block entropies and then other uh, uh, quantities um, that depend on the block entropies. Next week, we're going to get back to this question of, of that we brought up last week. We were kind of we were having to talk about the processes in reverse. We didn't really know how to think about it other than just state the intuitive idea that we're scanning the random variables in the opposite direction. And the question came up, well, if I have an epsilon machine that produces a process, well, I can certainly produce the process and then scan it in the opposite direction and then build the epsilon machine. But is there some way of just getting the reverse epsilon machine from the forward one directly? And it turns out this mixed state presentation is key. So next week, we'll talk about using mixed state presentations to reverse a process. And that turns out to be well, kind of interesting in its own right and also leads to efficient calculation of a whole other batch of complexity measures, including, somewhat surprisingly, this time symmetric quantity, the excess entropy. So anyway, I'm, I'm <laughs> giving sort of a heads up here because, well, you'll see why <laughs> I'm giving a heads up. <coughs> Sleeves up. OK, so review. Golden mean, process, right? No consecutive zeros. If you see a one, the next symbol is a fair coin flip, zero, one. This epsilon machine has two states. Uh, we have this binary alphabet, all very familiar. We have our matrix that gives the transitions on uh, zero symbols, the matrix that gives it all the transitions on one symbols. Right, just one transition here from A to B with probably a half on symbol zero. Here we have two transitions from A and B to A. If I'm B with probably one, I go to A. If I'm in A, probably half, I come back to A. Should all be very familiar by now. Uh, if we're interested in the internal uh, state process, we just sum over, just component-wise sum these symbol label transition matrices and get the internal Markov chain transition matrix. Um, if we solve for this eigenvalue equation, I'm doing left multiplication here, normalizing pi and probability, we get the asymptotic state probabilities. Okay, so that's all very familiar. Okay. M most of the time we spend uh, in state A. Yeah, Chris. Sorry. Can I ask you a question that could probably take a quick answer? I'm sure. curious, this should generalize to more than two states, right? Oh, sure. Yeah, arbitrary. Oh, yeah, yeah, I'll, I'll talk about some processes that have, um, I'm going to turn up the volume here in your speaker. Uh, yeah, you can have, I mean, I'd say right now a finite measurement alphabet. Uh, uh, it's easy to handle. To, um, um, we, we did talk about <coughs> some infinite state processes, um, but um, yeah, this can generalize a little bit. Extending <coughs> this all to, say, where the output was a continuous variable, that's the research frontier. Um, but, um, yeah. I'm just trying to be concrete here with the golden mean. And then uh, if we think of now the, the golden mean epsilon machine as a generator, like you might have noticed every once in a while, the edge labels, sometimes I, I put the transition probability on the left side with the output symbol on the right or vice versa. There are actually two modes of using uh, these epsilon machines. One is in this mode, transition probably output. We think of this as a generator. I have the model and I want to generate <coughs> the realizations. And then when it's the other way around, we think of it as a recognizer. It's reading in zeros and ones, calculating path. The machine is calculating path probabilities. My, my, my minor difference here. So here we've got this and the question is, well, what words does it produce and what are their probabilities and we calculate the word distribution this way. So we start with the uh, asymptotic invariant distribution. We have its product of the T01 matrices extended to words and then we sum things up with this column one vector and that'll give us the probability of <coughs> a word. Simple case, what's, what's the probability of seeing a zero? So we have two-thirds, one-thirds for the state probabilities times T0 uh, and then we sum things up. Well, okay, so we're starting here with two-thirds, one-third, uh, and then we see a zero. Well, we're in state A with probability two-thirds, and we're going to see a zero with probably half, so that's a contribution of one-third. 
And state B, probability one third, but we can't see a zero. So the probability of seeing a zero is one third. Same thing here, probably seeing a one is just pi times T1. Well, I'm here with probability two thirds. I can see a one with probability half, so that's one third contribution. I'm in state B with probability one third, but I'm going to see a one with probability one. Um, so that means I have a third and a third contribution, so the probability of seeing a one is two thirds, and so on. Okay, I'm going a little sort of pedantically here. And we calculate these things this way. I mean, this is already sort of showing you what I said before. If I wanted to calculate the probability of all the length 10 words, I'm going to have 2 to the 10 or 1,000 of these calculations to do. Oh. Tedious. Okay. So, just a notation for probability theory. We're going to have our discrete alphabet. Now we're just thinking of processes. We have a random variable time t, big X sub t, the instance of that, some value in the alphabet, time t, lowercase means particular value. And the way we think about this is this random variable x of t is distributed according to this or in the covert thomas notation, it's just simply to say tilde. Random variable is distributed as this distribution. We're going to use this a lot. <coughs> okay. We have different types of random variables, um, quantitative or categorical, age, voltage, temperature, whatever. Um, fine, that sort of makes sense. I can calculate the average age of people in the room or the average voltage in the circuit over an hour in my office. Categorical things, names, colors, uh, I don't quite know. But we still talk about, you know, the probability of being sunny, but does it make sense to calculate expectation value of the weather? You know, yeah, probably sunny and probably, you know, it's sunny in California, it's rainy in Tokyo, and therefore the expectation value is it's fog on Earth. I mean, it somehow, doesn't, for categorical variables, it doesn't really make sense. Expectation value of colors. Well, if you make the categorical variable red an RGB triplet or HSV triplet, then we can start talking about an average vector in, in color space. But until you, you make it quantitative, expectation value is a little bit sort of puzzling for categorical uh, random variables. For processes, we have our observed process, right? This giant joint distribution of the by infinite chain of random variables. Typically, we assume that all the marginals of this are time independent. The probabilities are time independent, therefore it's stationary. At a minimum, the epsilon machine is some sort of convenient representation of the process, but that's just one. There are alternatives. So, um, so we choose these alternatives based on how useful they are. And then given the epsilon machine, we can at least calculate the word distributions using this simple formula, vector matrix multiply. Now, we've been sort of focusing on just the observed process this way, and we need to be more careful. So really what's going on, especially if we have, imagine we have the model, it's a little generator, and it's generating zeros and ones that we observe, but then the states are changing. So really, the observed process or zeros and ones or whatever alphabet, the words over whatever alphabet, it's really a marginal distribution from the machine process, which is pairs of internal state output symbol, internal state output symbol, and so on. And we project onto just the measurement symbols when we talk about the process. But what the states are is actually important, obviously. And so it's, it's been, when we've been writing down something like, like this, it's been implied that we use the asymptotic invariant distribution. And the benefit of that is that then these word probabilities are stationary. They're probably the same anywhere in time. But that doesn't mean we always have to do that. We could, we could use other state distributions. And the only cost is that then maybe these word probabilities depend on time or the observed process is non-stationary. Uh, but we can certainly do that. So anyway, punchline is we're going to be a little more careful when we start to write down the word distribution like this. We're going to write out explicitly that it is an explicit average over state probabilities. Right. So what's the probability given that I started in a given state 
of seeing a word. So we go to each state, does it produce W, next state does it produce W, and then we add up those <coughs> probabilities. And that's what we mean by this, that, that the machine or process could have, could have generated the word starting from any state. OK, so that, this is just review. Um, some sort of computational things to note. So let's just say we have our state set V here. As I noted before, the number of words we're having to deal with grows exponentially with the length. So that's sort of burdensome. Is there a more efficient way to calculate these word distributions when we do this expression here? And the answer is yes. So the kind of straightforward and inefficient way <coughs> is, so here, we're asking for what's the probability of seeing the word ABC? And again, just applying the formula, that's pi, TA, TB, TC. And then we sum up with the unit vector. And if you just sort of write it out explicitly, you have to sum over all possible paths that could have produced A, B, or C. Okay, so that means the sum here is uh, the number of terms we have, each one of these variables goes over the number of states. The longer the word, we have another set of states we have to uh, uh, sum over, and so the number of paths grows exponentially with this. So that's bad. So, so this first method here, <coughs> just multiplying these things out, it's taking into account, it's calculating the probability of this word over all possible paths, and uh, that grows exponentially in the state size. So that's not so great. However, if you just a little bit of careful thought, and probably if one was programming this up, just the very fact it's so inefficient would lead you to think about grouping things in a different way. So the second way, which is completely equivalent to the first, is that we, every time we look at a new symbol from the word, we update, in, in a sense, summarize what's happened in the past by just pushing the state distribution forward with that single matrix. Well, that's a vector times a matrix, that's nice. And then I ha now I have a new <laughs> state distribution. Then I just go state distribution and I update it with, the, in this case, the B matrix, new state distribution. Okay, I have now three matrix multiplies. If it was length L, I'd have L matrix multiplies. Therefore, the second way of doing it is actually linear in the length. We're actually using the states to carry what we need from the past. We don't just throw all the paths out there and figure out which are the probability that they assign to ABC, we do this nested updating of the internal state distribution. All right, again, it's just like the synchronization problem. Oh, sunny, rain, and you're updating your distribution of the internal state of the Tahitian weather system. All right, so now we have this vector here, and then the, the sigma component of that is the probability that you produced W and ended up in state sigma. And then we just keep pushing that forward. So, so bad, good. <laughs> so rather than having your calculations sort of poop out on you, it's short word lengths, you can push this quite a lot further. Okay, so now, really terrible colors. Um, uh, right, so conditional probabilities, the way we've been thinking about them, uh, right, what's, what's the weather on Tahiti if I read in the paper that it rained yesterday? So we think of conditional probabilities being conditioning on events. Well, we have to modify that a bit. Why? Because what I was just talking about is we're conditioning on knowledge of the state, and that's a distribution. Actually, we're going to think of that as a random variable. So, uh, but that's, that's okay, you know. These conditional distributions, they're still distributions, we know how to work with them. Um, but uh, we're gonna need some notation to deal with conditional random variables. So what we mean by that, and I hope the notation will bring this across. So we have this uh, two letter alphabet, AB, and a random variable X. And I'm gonna define a new random variable that represents the distribution of Namely, the probabilities that x0 t is A or x0 is B. Okay, so, um, 
So and what I me mean here is that there's going to be this sort of hidden variable. I'm wondering how A and B are being produced depending upon what the, the current state is here. So this is going to be the probability that, that x0 is A or B conditioned on a particular state. So, um, and so in a way, this notation will let me sort of like occasionally sort of hide, hopefully not obscure the fact that we're depending on this condition. Um, also, there's a sort of an ambiguity here in when we look at entropy notation. Um, so the entropy of this new random variable is uh, um, it's conditioned on uh, the value that 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 this s state takes, and it's not the same thing as the uncertainty in the variable x zero given. Um, the previous state because this entropy we, we average over all possible states. Right? So, so this is a random variable that is the value describes the probability of seeing x given on a particular condition that is fixed. So here's one example of this. Um, so here we have our our machine process here, state symbol, state symbol, state symbol, so on, okay, going forward in time. And I define a new random variable, call it J0, that's distributed according to how the probability of X0 uh, is conditioned on S0 being A. So, so this random variable is the prob distributed according to the conditional probability of X0 given S0 is a particular value. So imagine that we're asking this, this, this is produced by the even process. So, and I sort of change this here, instead of zeros and ones, we have triangles and squares. So this is the even triangle process. So what's the probability that J0 is equal to a triangle? Well, what is that probability here? Well, just by the way we've defined it, probably that J0 is a triangle is so probably that X0 is a triangle, given that S0 was state A. Okay, so given that we're in state A, what's the probability of seeing a triangle? A half. And that's not the same thing as just asking for what the probability of X0 is when it's equal to a triangle. Right, that is this product here. Yeah? So, question then about conditional. So, would J0 even exist if S0 wasn't A? No, it's defined this way. Right. I'm, I'm defining this. I could, I could make, uh, you know, Q0 be S0 is B, and I have this new random variable. I guess right. it's just throwing me off that the random variable kind of isn't even, kind of, it depends on S0. Yeah, right. right. So I'm kind of, uh, right, I'm trying to describe, right. So this is a random variable that's described by not a distribution, but a conditional distribution. I'm calling it a conditional random variable. And it's related to the event set x, but now the event set x is being partitioned up by this other state variable here in this case. Yeah. Um, yeah. Right. So, so, so this down here, this probability, it's just, when is x0 a triangle? Well, I'm here two thirds of the time, I see a triangle half the time. I'm here one-third of the time, you see triangle with probability one, so that's two-thirds times a half, that's one-third, one-third times one, and I end up with two-thirds again, just like before. Okay, so that's straightforward. Um, and these are various constructions we'll use. Maybe it'll be a little more intuitive when we get to the examples. Uh, another example would be defining uh, this conditional random variable F2, that's the probability of being in state two given that back at time zero, I started in sigma zero. So, so what's the probability of that F2 is describing the probability of ending up here, or I should say my uncertainty in here, given that I started over here in a particular state, call it A or B. Okay, so now I can condition on this. Right, so the point here is I need to be able to talk about sort of telescoping conditions. That's so what's the probability that X2 is equal to a particular value, you know, triangular square, given that F2 was sigma 2. In other words, and what that means is, we we'll just unpack that, I'm going to rewrite F2 here out explicitly. It's this conditional random variable, and now 
I'm saying that f2 is equal to sigma 2. That means this first variable here takes on that value. So now I have this conditional random variable that's s2 is equal to sigma 2. Here I end up in sigma 2 when I started here in, s in sigma 0. Well, that's fine. We can just drop the conditioning here. These are just events. Uh, same thing as the joint event. S2 uh, was sigma 2 and S0 was sigma 0. Okay. So I just unpack that there. But then we can simplify this, of course, because we're using these causal states. And shielding means I only have to worry about the immediately preceding state, so I can simplify that. So this is just kind of example calculation. I'm interested in this condition up here. And later on, these are going to turn into distributions um, over states like this. Um, and in this particular case, the uncertainty in X2, given that F2 was sigma 2, this value up here, the same thing is asking about X2, given that, we, that, that that state was actually sigma 2. So, so this F2 variable sort of collapses down because of shielding to being equivalent to asking about the state at time 2. Um, okay, so just to draw a contrast here, so we just established we had this probability identity and then also down at the level of the information, the uncertainty, uh, condition either on F2 or S2, those are the same. However, when we talk about without conditioning this way, we just talked about, well, what's the uncertainty in X2 given F2 without fixing it? That means we're averaging over the realizations of F2 this conditional entropy. That's just sort of the standard definition of that, right? But now I can sort of now unpack this a little bit. Uh, this is this conditional random variable uh, over S2 and S0 fixed at sigma 2 and sigma 0. But that's not the same thing as the uncertainty in X2 given S2, right? This, we only would condition over um, the value of S2. We would have suppressed this condition that was built into F2. So these two quantities needn't be the same because F2 has built in this, I guess, sort of hidden condition. Okay, I guess sort of a final example here. Uh, right, so G2 is the probability of our uncertainty in S2 given that X2 had a particular value. Okay, so we're sort of, given that we saw this observed symbol, we now have, we induce a conditional distribution over the previous state we could have been in. And now I'm going to ask a question about the probability of the next state. I'm just kind of making these up to show the different constructions here. So, so, okay, so that's probability of S3 given G2, then these are fixed. Um, so then since G2 is now being fixed at sigma 2, that means that this first variable is being set to sigma 2. So I just rewrite this again. Probability of S3 given now this condition, conditional random variable, I just break it out into the separate events. It's now a joint event, um, right? And then you can even say something noted down here. If, if uh, given that S2 is fixed and X2 is fixed, if this was an epsilon machine, then the probability would be 0 or 1 whether I was going to sigma 3 at time 3, depending upon whether that was allowed or disallowed transition. Okay. Um, same thing with the, you know, there's the, the entropic version of this, the uncertainty. In, in S3, given that G2, this conditional random variable, is sigma 2, again, that's just simply this. You know, conditional distribution, that would be 0 if the machine was in the feeler. Um, generally, again, just applying the straight definition, if I was in, interested in the uncertainty in S3, given G2, without it being fixed, then I'm averaging over the, the conditions, realizations this conditional entropy, right, the uncertainty in S3, given the different realizations or possible values of G2. Again, this unpack this again. We have this conditional random variable, its probability. We got this above here, 
this network condition on this joint event, sigma 2, x2. Um, and that's generally not the same thing as the uncertainty in S3 given the state distribution S2 and that we fixed x2 to be a particular value. Again, it's because of uh, we have this, this hidden condition here. Okay, so, so, right, so, so these nested conditions have a certain syntax and meaning to them, but you just sort of unpack them till you just have everything be an event, and then we're back into the realm of sort of normal probabilities. So what does this generally look like? If we have this conditional random variable A prime, probably of A, given that B was little b, then we can talk about the uncertainty in some third event C, given that A prime was equal to A, well what we mean by that is now we fixed this uh, conditional distribution so that the thing we're, um, that's being conditioned takes a particular value. So this is just now a single number, as it were. And then, it's, then this, the way we're conditioning the random variable on this, this conditional random variable turns out to be just the uncertainty in C given A and B. Um, and that's different from if we don't fix the conditional random variable, right? So that's just rewriting the definition of A prime the uncertainty in C given con conditional event A given b little b, which if you sort of write that out, that's now we're averaging over this random variable, although it's one component is, is uh, fixed at b, and then we average over the values that A could take in the conditional random variable, and then that's weighting the conditional uncertainty in C given the conditional random variable. And again, sort of and a third form of this is just looking at the uncertainty of, of comparing. We have this last conditional entropy on C given A and B, this sort of joint event. Then that's, that's different than if we haven't fixed A. Again, what we mean here in the definition of this conditional <laughs> uncertainty is that the, the, the random variables that are not fixed are the things we sum over that we use to weight the conditional entropy. Okay, so, so, right, so now getting back to where we're going to use this uh, conditional random variable uh, notation. Again, we're interested in the word distribution, and now we're being uh, careful to be clear that it depends on the state distribution. Uh, as we produce the word. So, so before we were just conditioning on events um, and now we are sort of conditioning on these state distributions when we calculate word probabilities and entropies. And we have to make this dependence on the, the state explicit. And I guess it's natural enough if we think of this as a generator. Um, and this, this, if you look at this, this expression, it sort of looks like, well, you're doing the state average of something kind of looks like an expectation value. So we could think of this as like instance of a random variable, or if you like, conflate it to think of it as like an event. It's like a temperature. Well, it's a number. And we're averaging this number over the states. Okay. So th this is, I guess it's, yeah, it's sort of a, this funny semantic shift here. I mean, to make this explicit, you could imagine we just come up with, define this sort of uh, random variable I should say distributed as the, the this conditional distribution, right? And what what so the, the values that this random variable takes are the probabilities that uh, uh, you know the word is W if you started in A or you started in B, right? It could be two thirds, one third, and th that would be the values of Z. Then you know the probability of Z taking a particular. Uh, uh, value, two-thirds or one-third, well, just plug in, it's probably that z is actually equals that probability. Um, and that just depends on what state you visit, right? The, everything that's driving it here is what state you're in. If you're in state A, I have this probability. If I'm in state B, I have this probability. So in fact, this does look like sort of an, uh, an average. If I average z over this, over the, its distribution, 
so I'm z here, averaging over the different values it can take, the probability that those values occur, and you end up back with that original expression. So this is the way of thinking about um, how uh, the calculating these, these word probabilities condition on the state. It's, it's, it's as, as if we're averaging these numbers over these events, over uh, the state probabilities. But that's, I don't know, maybe this is over tedious or kind of flogging a dead horse. Um, we could just sort of, by definition, just kind of agree to start conditioning on the state distribution here so that these averages over these numbers that we're interested in, these state probabilities, right? I want to know over which state I could produce the, the uh, word, have its probability, and then we weight those by the state probabilities. Okay, so the other thing we're going to do is think back to that uh, calculating, uh, updating the state probabilities. We're calculating um, um, the word um, distributions. Um, we're going to think of the random variable as actually being uh, vector probabilities over the states. So for example, for the word probabilities, um, so now we can have, we can ask about what, what's, what's the probability of producing a word given that, it, say, is the, the states, uh, starting at time t, are distributed according to the um, SNP stationary measure. That's just this formula here, <coughs> right? And, and now, Imagine we, we didn't sort of sum this up. This is actually a vector of, of probabilities. Or we can now think of this as the, uh, the random variable we were just averaging over the states. OK. Uh, but we can also talk about you know, other distributions besides pi, right? Imagine it's a uniform distribution. Then the probability of seeing these words starting with the uniform distribution is just simply the sum, since all of the, these uh, states are equally likely, you just have the factor of one over the number of states, and we just then sum up these conditional probabilities, having produced the word, or just in general, right? We can now start talking about producing, probably producing words when the states are just given by some arbitrary initial state distribution, and then we just generalize our expression here, just left multiplied by mu, tw, and then sum up. Um, so this notation is, it's okay. Um, it's trying to make explicit what has been implicit before. So, uh, right, so, so this is, uh, right, what's the probability of that x takes on value? Little x given this state. Now this is just sort of the random variable or we can also be clear how it's distributed. We can put in the distribution there. Um, so these are probabilities, right? This is the probability that x1 is equal to x. That's a number. That's a number. Okay. And then we can also work with distributions the same way. Right? Now we just have, we can condition on both s1 and s1 given a particular distribution. And then this is a set of numbers. All the possible probabilities that x can take for its realizations. It gets a little bit dicey though when we're working with entropies. Um, it's a little bit ambiguous. I mean, typically what we mean by the uncertainty of the next symbol given the current state is we're going to do a state average of the uncertainty in the next symbol for each state. Right? So that's just state average, in some sense, the, the branching uncertainty here from each state, conditional entropy. And or in simplified form, it's just that we always put the joint uh, distribution out in front of the log. And then the argument of the log is the particular kind of entropy we're looking at. In this case, a symbol state conditional entropy. Um, but there's also sort of possible when we write this, the same uh, notation down that we could have meant with th now thinking about these conditional random variables that, that this is the entropy over this conditioned random variable. So now I've got this p log p expression I'm applying to this conditioned random variable that x1 is equal to x conditioned on s1 in, in both uh, places there. Uh, but if you work this through, you see there's this ambiguity. Um, 
we could just sort of unpack this here. Um, right? This probability is the probability that we're going to see. So here we're averaging over x, um, values of x, and then uh, also over the states here. That's what this conditional probability is, just the probability of, of uh, we're averaging over the states here but that we're conditioning on. So we pull out the state probability and multiply that, weight the, the conditional probability of x given sigma. And then we do the same thing in here, same expression, but notice that now this, this just turns into the joint distribution in both places. And this is a, a different expression than this one. So there are ways that um, in this new notation that we have to be careful. We can't unpack things certain ways. In particular, this way doesn't, doesn't quite work. Um, so, so the first thing is just the average entropy of this variable conditioned on the events, all the state events, x. This one down here, what, the way we're thinking about this is the entropy of this variable for different S1 distributions. And it leads to this sort of confusing um, alternative. Right, in fact, this, this is just the marginal distribution over x. Marginal distribution over x. In some sense, we've... So we have to be careful with that. Um, so what we're going to do is, when we write this down, we'll mean the first thing. The average entropy of x1 conditioned on the state events. And then, uh, when we want to talk about averaging over particular distributions, then we're going to put in how the, the conditioning random variable is distributed. So. Right, so, so this later thing, like the, the last example, just reduced to entropy in the, in the first variable, something was not what we intended. Um, but now, with this new notation, we can be explicit about what we're conditioning on. And of course, we recover when mu is equal to pi the quantities we were using before, namely the asymptotic invariant measure. The important thing about this is now we can start looking at how uncertainty is changing if we start with different state distributions. In particular, we're going to be updating these distributions as we go along. So we need to be very explicit about the state distributions we're conditioning on. Maybe that's kind of the main point of this somewhat tortured notational <laughs> description. Uh, okay, so for example, uh, odd process. So this generates one one or three ones and then a zero. So just the odd analog of the even process. Um, the asymptotic distribution is two-fifths, two-fifths, one-fifth here, ABC. And we can ask about what's the probability at time three that we see a zero, given that at time three we were in state A and the initial state distribution was di distributed according to pi. Okay, and that's a question. Okay, so what does that mean given how we've developed this? Well, first of all, um, this, again, this, this is uh, uh, this random variable is distributed according to the distribution. That means we're going to average over it using its weights, right? Times zero, what state probability we had, those. Um, and then, uh, <coughs> well, of course, this is like a previous example. Because of causal shielding, we can actually, this, this probability here, conditional probability here, seeing zero at time three doesn't depend on what the state start state probability was. It just depends on the immediately preceding state. So we can drop that. But now we're still sort of averaging over, right? We're carrying forward that, that state distribution. But notice now, this probability doesn't depend on sigma, what the start state was. We pull that out, and then we just, we're just summing this distribution over sigma. Well, that's one. So we end up basically showing that in this case, we forget the initial distribution. It only depends on the previous state. And that is, right, time three, I'm in A, what's the probability of seeing a zero, a half? Okay. Yeah. But we can choose a different state distribution and ask a similar question. So this, <clears throat> right, so imagine that we have mu just defined to be uniform probability over states A, B, C, and we want to know what the probability of, you know, the next symbol at time three is, given that, say, at time one, that was the distribution of state probabilities. Okay. Uh, so, well, we know how to uh, calculate this. We can just take mu, push it forward uh, three time steps. In the last step, we use the symbol transition matrix that produces the symbol we're asking about, and then sum that up. 
right? Remember, and here we just can use t, to, because all we really need to do is to update the state distribution. Nothing, the first two steps, we, we're not asking anything about the, the observed symbols, right? Um, so that's the same thing as, uh, this probability here is the same thing as, um, instead of S1 at time one being distributed as mu, we can look at S2 being distributed as mu t. We just pushed it forward. Or at time three, it was mu t t. So we pushed it forward another step. And that's you know, easier to answer. Here I can go out to step three and say, oh, that's my current state distribution. I can go to the states and then just look one step ahead rather than sort of think about this extended over at three time steps. Um, in this, the, uh, the only thing that's really uh, important is the relative time difference. So here I was specifying mu at time one and looking at two steps later at the observed symbol. I could have specified mu at time two and looked up at time four for x so that we can shift that way. Um, um, but you can't just shift this random variable here forward when mu is not the asymptotic state distribution. When mu is, well, then as I'm operating on it, I just get mu back. I mean, get, get pi back. So then that'll be stationary. So you can't just shift this, this variable around. Why isn't that turning red? Odd. This thing must be missing colors. OK, so um, yeah. So what are the shorthands we have here? Um, so I write down the probability that at time t we see little x conditioned at being on a state at time t. What this is is a set of numbers, the size of which is the number of states. And each of those numbers is the problem that you're going to see little x for each one of the states. right? Whereas if I don't fix one of the random variables, then this is now a larger set of numbers, namely the probability that we see little x for the pairs, c little x and c state sigma. Okay. Um, right, so now when we talk about uh, what these numbers mean, right, we're thinking of this as the average number average likelihood we're going to see x, but averaged over the state probabilities, right? So that would be the expected probability. When we write this, the expected probability, right? Um, or if we're not fixing the variable that's being conditioned, what we mean is the distribution over this. It's the expected distribution, right? So up here we had these numbers, one for each state. And down here we have a distribution that is now we have a distribution for each state we could be in. So it's four different things. And then we average over the states, each one of those numbers, and we end up with a distribution over x. Okay. So hopefully, uh, as we go forward, the context will help us um, get rid of any ambiguity here. Either we can think of sets of numbers, sets of conditional probabilities, conditional probabilities, or expected probability or expected distribution. Okay, so en enough of that. Um, right. So here's an example process. Uh, I should say this is a presentation that generates a process. It happens to be the epsilon machine for that process. And we have a fair coin flip from A, and then no matter what, we come from B or C back to A. So it's almost kind of like a period two thing, except uh, when we go from C back to A, we flip a coin and generate zero, 01. Coming back from B, we generate a zero with probability one. So the way to think about the problem is that uh, we know the model. So we took our data in our lab, but then we left for lunch. The experiment was still running. We come back and we don't know where it is. So we have the model and we can, for example, calculate the, given the model, so our expectation, if we've been away for a while, is kind of in statistic equilibrium. So this is. Actually, this, this vector here is pi, the asymptotic state distribution, a half, a quarter, a quarter. And then the states colored in red here give the probability 
magnitudes. And so this is the state of affairs when you just walk back in the lab. We haven't seen anything yet. Okay, and this, a half, a quarter core are our expectations if we assume equilibrium. So we got this one helpful way of thinking about this is looking at the time evolution of the state distributions. So this particular state distribution is, it's a, you know, normalized over three states, over three variables, therefore it's on a simplex and all of the probabilities that sum to one and are between zero and one lie in this triangle. So think of that as a two-dimensional surface. This initial state distribution is over here. It's, you know, not much of B, not much of C, and about half of A. So half a quarter, quarter. I should, should visualize this. Okay, so now what we'll do is read in a word and then talk through how our expectations of what state the, what hidden state the process is and get updated. Okay, so the first step will be we see a one. Okay, so then looking at the model, we know there's no way to get to B on a one. So there's no probability flowing over there. However, we started with probably two thirds here, and I'm sorry, probably one quarter, one half here, one quarter here. So on a one, we take the half probability, and we take half of that and move it over here. So we now, on the next step, having seen a one, we have one, one quarter here. We had one quarter probability before we saw anything, and then we took seeing a one that takes a half of that, which is an eighth, and moves it over here. So we end up with this partial distribution of a quarter and an eighth, which when you normalize it, makes the probability state C two thirds and probability state A is one third. Right, so you have a, an eighth and a quarter, that's three eighths, divide that vector distribution, quarter, sorry, an eighth and a quarter by three eighths and you get one third, two thirds. And then our, our mixed state is updated now the, the mixed state lays along a sub-simplex, namely just the line, the one-dimensional simplex between C and A, because there's no probability of being in B. So we're just along here. So on the edge of the simplex. So then uh, we see, uh, so we update our mixed state in this simplex, or we can think of it this way, on distribution on the states. We see another one. We have, we have a new mixed state here. So we had uh, two-thirds here, one-third here. Half of one third is a six. We had two thirds. We take half of that, that's one third. So we have one third, one six. We normalize, we get two thirds, one third again. Okay, then this, the red is the current mixed state having seen one one. See another one. It just happens to just swap these probabilities like this, but we have to go through the calculation again, which is just what we did before. And we come up and we can visit uh, this same mixed state again. Okay. Now uh, we'll see a zero. So now what happened is we had whatever was here, an A, it moves over here. We take just half of that probability mass. And whatever was at C, we move that over here. Okay, so that was, if I get the phase right on this, right. So two thirds, half of that is a third, ends up at A. We had one third here, take a half of that's a six, so we have a third and a sixth, and again it normalizes out, having seen the zero to two thirds, one third. Now we can see another uh, zero. Now what happens is that, in fact, having seen that, our expectation is now 50 50 for B and C. You go through that calculation again. And then now we're down here, we can't B and C, so now we're in the sub simplex between A and B, and exactly 50 50, like that. And then on the next symbol, I'm just choosing allowed symbols as I like to illustrate things. The next symbol is a one. And what happens is that now we had A and B with positive probability, but there's nothing leaving B on a one. So that doesn't participate. We had this probability up here and whatever it was, we take half of that down to here, but the C is the only one that has probability. When we normalize it, we get this, call it delta function right on C. The mixed state moves up to one of the vertices. Okay, so we get the 
basically the, the kind of visual picture here of what it means to finally have synchronized. Now, having seen that sequence starting from state ignorance, we now know exactly what state we're in. So we call this a synchronizing word. There are words that will take you to this if you have the right kind of presentation. This is a property, synchronization like this, a property of the model itself. We'll, we'll talk about some examples that don't synchronize. And then, because this particular presentation is unifeeler, happens to be the epsilon machine, it's minimal, unifeeler, every other, as I read more symbols that are allowed, I stay in the state of being synchronized. I, I never lose that. Again, that's one of the nice properties of you know, feeler presentations. It just kind of hops around now. And the dynamic on the simplex is just hopping between the vertices. Stochastically, because I'm sort of choosing the allowed transitions to take. <clears throat> so over to B, after I see a zero. Back to A if I see another zero. And so on. So we're kind of hopping around here stochastically on the simplex of state distributions. Okay, so that's the main idea, right? I made an assumption we start in the asymptotic state distribution pi, and we're just trying to answer the question, how do we update our knowledge of the, st of the state? Okay. So I, maybe that's more intuitive than all this conditional random variable stuff, but actually that's, you're having to calculate where these things. So, so, so what are these mixed states? Okay, so, so in the simplex, we had, uh, you know, these various dots here. Now we're thinking of the, A, it's a random variable, or it's actually this point in the simplex that's hopping around. So two different representations of this to describe the evolution of our knowledge or uncertainty about the internal state as we're making measurements. So we have now some induced dynamic over this new kind of state space. Well, let's say state distribution space, the simplex. So that's what we want to track with these mixed states. That's basically what they are. So they're distribu state distributions that are induced by having seen a word. Um, so let's just look at words of length L. And then our notation here will be at time t, uh, having seen no words, lambda in this case, uh, will be in this mixed state mu. So we're going to come up with this more compact notation here uh, of the mixed state at time t having seen some symbol or word, okay? So what we're going to do is this will be where we start. At time t, there'll be some state distribution mu having seen nothing. That's what that one means, okay. So then, uh, now, so again, so now these, <laughs> this is a, uh, a, a, a random variable. Well, it's a state distribution. Well, it's a random variable, okay. I think we're comfortable with it now, but there is some formal um, 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 trickery here. So, so what's the probability of at time t plus l uh, being in state sigma given uh, that we observed word w? Well, write this in more familiar notation and this is where all the previous formal rigmarole, what we mean is the probability that the state at time t plus l is sigma given that we saw word w going from time t to t plus l, that block, having started with this initial distribution, having seen nothing and in that mixed state. Okay, so this is the general sort of way we're gonna push distributions forward based on observing sequences. So then these mixed states really are random variables. They're hopping around. They're being driven by a random variable, namely the word that you're observing. Um, uh, they're conditioned on these two things. Um, so the word and, 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 the, uh, and the mixed state, um, of course. And then typically, what we've been doing is just time is zero and then this initial distribution we take to be the asymptotic distribution. But as we just saw, there are other questions one uh, has where we use different mu's and push them forward. Okay, so the simplex picture is really based on thinking of now a different you know, representation for the mixed states, distributions as just vectors in some vector space. Um, right, if we have three states, it was a two-dimensional sheet, um, and we can see how to calculate these um, state distributions. We just simply write out what we had before, right? It's the state that we're in, 
at time t plus l, given we saw length l word and started with this distribution, well, that's a conditional distribution. I can write it as a joint distribution over a marginal. That's just a probability identity. And then we know how to calculate both of these. That's just given by our familiar formulas before. So now this is the way we can directly calculate starting from a given uh, mixed state at time t and then going forward uh, Basically, this is what I was talking through in the example, and then that last normalization step is given by the denominator. Just to make, so this, this is a, some kind of partial distribution. I just push the state probabilities around on the model, and then I just make it a normalized distribution after that. <coughs> and then, so now this, this sort of uh, dynamic, I now know how to push mixed states forward, basically. Uh, and what we've been doing, of course, is, um, you know, just taking the asymptotic distribution pi times zero, and we get this, this simpler uh, expression. Just, if we start with the asymptotic state distribution, we can calculate the mixed state having seen a word of length L this, this way. So for the even process, just to focus in a little bit, we essentially did <laughs> almost numerically the same example, but now we just have a two-state process over triangles and squares. The even triangle process, we'll start the initial mixed state off in the asymptotic state distribution two-thirds in A, one-third in B. And then the question is, what's the mixed state at time step one having seen a triangle? Well, that's the state distribution conditioned on having seen this past, namely triangle. And then we're now sort of denoting the, the and being explicit about the initial state distribution that at time zero is distributed according to pi. So then we just push pi forward using T delta and then we normalize it. So when you push it forward, right, we have two-thirds, one-third. Push it forward having seen a delta, two-thirds, half of that is a third. We had a third here before, but the, and that moves to probability one, so we take all of it over to here, so we get a third, a third. So this is this partial distribution vector, and then we sum that up. Well, that's two-thirds, and then we use that to normalize, and then we get half a half. So initially, we start out with this, we've made this assumption, oh, it's been running for a long time. It's in statistical e equilibrium, most likely in state A. As soon as I see a delta, I conclude that it's equally likely to be in either of these. So my state uncertainty can change over time until, in this case, we hit a synchronizing word and then I would get the delta function and there'd be no more state uncertainty. Start thinking about the, this, it's a, it's a new kind of dynamical system over these state spaces, these simplicial state spaces. These are just vector spaces. The vectors are these probability distributions. They're normalized. And we think about them on some Simplex. So if we just had, if we had two states, there'd be a one-dimensional simplex, you know, probability A, probability of B, there'd be this one-dimensional space along which those probabilities uh, between zero and one and sum to one. We have uh, three states, that's what we were talking about before. We have this surface, and then over the surface, they're sort of, you know, Notable points, the vertices are the, what I call the delta function distributions. We know exactly what state we're in. The center point is always the state of maximum uncertainty. And then, you know, all the other points, including the boundaries, are allowed. So, if we're on one of the, you can think of, if I, you know, arbitrary distributions over three states are just points here. But as we saw before, when we uh, synchronized, or even before we, we can synchronize to a subspace, you have distributions where you know you're not in some state and that just collapses the dimension you're currently operating in. Um, so what, what are these things? So they're just the uncertainty in the state, given some starting distribution and a word you've observed. We can look at the, the, the mixed state entropy as a way of detecting whether or not we're in a state with probability one. So this would be our informational criterion for being synchronized, right? So we, when, when, when the state distribution is all zeros except for one, one, then we know with probability one what state we're in. Uh, so we think of these, these mixed states with zero entropy as the sort of points of the, the vertices of the simplex, they're so-called pure states. And then all the other um, possible state distributions are spanned by those pure state vectors, and they're, hence they're called mixtures of the pure states. Right, we can write an arbitrary state distribution in terms of these, these pure states. 
So it's very handy to just look at this geometric, uh, geometrically. Um, also, uh, and this is getting a little bit into the sort of the induced dynamic. We're sort of talking about the state space now. The induced dynamic um, is actually uh, many to one. So in particular, you can have uh, the same words lead to the same, sorry, different words lead to the same uh, mixed state. Right? So like we saw before here, we had two thirds, one third, and then after one step, seeing a triangle, we had two thirds, one third here, and if I see two more, it just permutes it and permutes it again. So either one triangle or three triangle word lead to that mixed state. So this mapping on the simplex going forward, I can have for a given mixed state any number of pre-images. I shouldn't say any number, finite number of pre-images. Okay, so the basic idea is that there's a certain natural dynamic over words, right? That's just concatenation. I go from a word and I add something on here to, it, to make a new word. Um, we have this equivalence relation between words now where they end up when we're looking on the simplex Two different words can end up in the same mixed state. Um, we think of, you know, the, the mixed state is a state of state uncertainty. Hence the sort of hierarchical picture we, we give here. And then the, then the dynamic that's induced over words, we have concatenation. And then for each one of these, we can ask, oh, given that we specify the initial mixed state, what mixed state do I go to? I have a word that induces another mixed state, then in the way this diagram commutes, then there is a mapping from mixed state to mixed state on symbol. So, interestingly, this representation of mixed states, mixed state dynamic is unifeeler, which means that, again, given the mixed state and the symbol, I go to unique next state. There may be many pre-images, but there's always, I know exactly what state I'm going to, given the previous one and the symbol. Okay, so that was a lot of work. Yeah. <laughs> so is, is there some sort of uh, mapping of this output process mid state to the input process transient states? Yes. Yes, in fact, I wasn't really distinguishing recurrent mixed state from transient mixed state, which we will next time. Yes, good leading question, yeah, right. Yeah, exactly, so, so it's kind of, uh, right, so, so I mean, okay, yeah, so, so what we've done here, we've moved from, and you know, all the previous examples, the way I've been talking, is as if we had a probabilistic finite state machine, and we were talking about, oh, I'm in this state, or this state, or this state, well, okay. Sometimes we're not certain, and that came up a bunch. Now we've shifted up to this other picture where we have this dynamic over these mixed states, and we're tracking dynamically how our uncertainty and state's shifting based on what we've observed. They're analogs to being synchronized or to being in a, the recurrent state uh, of the epsilon machine at the, at the vertices of the simplex when we have those delta function uh, mixed states. Uh, but they're, they're corresponding questions that we had before for the epsilon machine, transient states, recurrent states, same thing comes up here. And we'll actually see that, for example, we can work with the transient states quite naturally and it leads us, uh, I'll give you a nice simple expression, kind of closed form expression for the synchronization information. The total uncertainty as we synchronize. And that's working just with the transient states, transient mixed states. But along the way, it turns out, this is also uh, kind of harkening back to the, when we're talking about the computational complexity of calculating word, the word distribution, there also lets us deal very handily with an efficient way of calculating um, block entropies and so on using the mixed states. Very efficient. So. Okay, so that was a lot, or dense, I should say. <laughs> um, uh, so I'll, I'll finish unless there are questions. And we'll come back, and Thursday will be more application-driven. And you'll see some of this and why I had to bend over backwards to worry about some of the notation um, on Thursday. 